I just finished with doing Mr. Cameron's film, The Abyss, which was, you know, the most challenging and difficult film that I'd ever worked on. I mean, it was a massive undertaking. I had with me on that film, it was Darren Docterman, and he, he, had, he learned a lot too. I worked with the production designer, Les Dilley, on his previous film, The Abyss, which was actually the first movie that I worked on. You know, he was a good boy and um, learned a lot, and he's become a very good art director. That was uh, an amazing experience, and uh, luckily I was able to survive, and uh, Les brought me along to the next movie, which was Exorcist, uh, at the time they were calling it Exorcist 15 years after, which uh, I, I couldn't understand why they would call something that, but I guess they were, they were flailing even then to find a name for it. It was really a lot of fun. We got to go to uh, Wilmington, North Carolina on location, which was, uh, you know, another, another boatload of fun too. North Carolina, I've done two or three films there and um, I like it very much. They're, the guys are great, they've got good crews there. At the beginning, it was basically uh, Les, me, uh, an illustrator, Simon Merton, and uh, another illustrator, an older gentleman that I can't remember his name, please forgive me, um, and Bill Blatty, who was in the next office. And that was it for at least a couple weeks. Les and I had worked together uh, on one of my father's films, Peter Merton, over in England. And, and at this point, I was just starting out over here in Los Angeles, and he gave me the, the chance to come and join him on, um, on his film. And uh, we went to Wilmington, North Carolina, which I'd been to previously on a film called King Kong Lives. And um, so, you know, there I was, getting on the plane and um, off we went to Exorcist Land. And that was a lot of fun. When I first came in, I was wearing my Abyss crew jacket and I had my name sort of embroidered on it. And, you know, Darren kind of looks like Damien from, uh, from far away. And Blatty took one look at that and said, what is, is your name Damien? And I said, no, no it's Darren. And I said, oh, that was, that was a little bit scary. <laughs> so he was, <laughs> the first time I met him, he was, uh, he was uh, scared of me. I had a great time with him and um, he was always, you know, uh, interested in my ideas and uh, I obviously was interested in his because he was kind of, you know, somebody you don't get to meet very often. In the, in the early days, he was, he was, you know, gung-ho and very excited about everything and, and uh, you know, he was, uh, you know, he had, done, he had done a film before, uh, The Ninth Configuration, I think. So, but this was his, you know, sort of big return to a big studio movie and, and to the, you know, the series of movies that he had created. It was, it was a pleasure. I never had any problems with, um, with him. Uh, he, he may have had some problems with me, but <laughs> no. They shot a lot in, I think, Washington, D.C. And, uh, but, you know, all the sets were done in, on the stages in Wilmington. The sets and locations were, were broken down pretty much exactly like you see them. I think uh, most of the exteriors were done really quickly in a couple weeks in Washington, D.C., in Georgetown. Um, and that was the main sort of uh, exteriors. I think we had a couple other exteriors in the Wilmington area, but everything inside on the sets were built uh, at the DEG stages in Wilmington. Uh, that uh, hospital set was a big deal and it worked and it was built and, um, and there were several things that I liked about it. The hospital set, which was all contiguous, all the hospital rooms and the and the disturbed ward. All that was in a contiguous set, so it was all attached by actual hallways and everything. We did a fun, a fun gag on one of the end of the hallways uh, that Les was very proud of because he, he loves doing this kind of thing, a forced perspective at the end of the hallway. Because you can, can, can create the depth with smaller people at the back end, they're walking left and right and a bit forward and back, but you can't do it for, for too long. But, um, you know, if you walk down there too far, you will be in the miniature area. We had uh, arches in the hallways and we built consecutively smaller arches that made the hall look, you know, like three times bigger. When you look at it with the camera, you can't tell because you force the perspective. It's calculated from you can pan round and go face down it and everything else. And of course, it would come to lunchtime and there would be people chatting and they're all going to go off to get lunch. 
and they're all walking down the forced perspective. <laughs> and it, it happened time and time again till they get to the end and they've got the meeting, the little guys that have got in the, the clothing, you know, the small clothing on and everything else. And they go, oh, crazy. <laughs> and that was fun. We had that on, uh, you know, the end of the long hallway. And then, of course, people are talking to each other when they're going along and they're not taking any notice about it. And then, then suddenly they find <laughs> they're at this height, you know, about to hit their heads. But that was an impressive set because, you know, when if you sort of squinted, you were in a hospital and that, that was it, you know. And you turn the corner and, oh, no, it's another decapitated statue, but <laughs> which happens. There are some full tracking shots and, you know, it's, there are a couple different reasons to build a set like that contiguous it, because it's, honestly, it's better for the actors to, you know, to make them feel at home in this, you know, as if they were on location. It also helps with something like that, that you don't have to do a lot of tricks to, you know, like fake a room somewhere else and then sort of, you know, you know, pan the camera really fast into, into a, another set to make you think that you're on the same set. And uh, having everything there was, uh, was really, you know, easier for the production crew so they don't have to go anyplace else. And uh, it's, it's much easier for the actors so that they could really get into the scenes lady crawling on the ceiling which was a you know a technical challenge in those days you know it wasn't a cgi thing it was um, a real thing and they, they asked me how, how are we going to do it i said well we'll have to t you know build the ceiling upside down put it on the ground and and um have the lady crawl over it and shoot it and then put it up on top of the film that we've shot below and it worked. I, I saw it just recently and it was pretty cool where she's racing across there <laughs> looking and quite scary the you know all the symbolism of the you know the, the decapitated statues and the joker face on the uh, bishop statue that that was supposed to be the joker i mean blatty said i want it to be the joker and so we had brian cole our sculptor sculpt up a joker face it shows up for what three seconds but you know exactly what it is and it's frightening as hell my job from what i can remember was to do the storyboards and do some keyframe um, illustration work. My storyboards were more like um, for the visual effects shots and prop making stuff. What I am most proud of though in the film was I got to design those shears. I don't know why anyone would use these. <laughs> I really don't. But they're certainly, they're certainly, they turned out to be an iconic thing. And uh, that was one of the first things that I actually got to work on back when we were in Los Angeles with uh, William Peter Blatty looking over my shoulder. Um, you know, we originally got some research of, you know, what actual garden shears were like and what, uh, what um, autopsy materials were like and what those sort of utensils were. Nothing looked like that. Nothing looked like that. But that's what he wanted. He wanted something that was completely unbelievable and treat it like it was real. Uh, because it, it's just horrific. Uh, you know, we, I think we called them, uh, we, we called them the pig cutters because you could slice a pig in half with it. Um, but uh, that was a lot of fun and basically it, it was a, a, a pair of sort of garden shears that I re redecorated to make it look like uh, medical equipment and uh, Doug Fox, the prop master, made a bunch of those. I was so happy to see those when they, you know, finally uh, were done because it was exactly like I drew them and that, that was that was one of the first things that I actually drew that actually got made in a movie and that was a lot of fun. I remember the shears for sure, certain. Yeah, the common, yeah, I do and it was a scary thing. They had to be, you know, they had to be noticeable and, you know, the first time where the uh, autopsy uh, uh, position uh, lifts them up, you know, and they add that wonderful sound effect to it. It had to be something that you would, oh, well, okay, this, there's something coming with this, I know. I have memories of the famous hallway sequence, and I know exactly how it was put together, because as that is shooting outside, the, outside in the hall, and we're waiting for the apparition to go through with the shears, I was in one of those rooms painting It's a Wonderful Life on the wall in blood. Every time I see that, I sort of, I don't think about how scary it is. I mean, it's scary in the movie when you see it, but I'm not thinking about that. I'm thinking I was holding my breath in one of these rooms, sort of under a bed with fake blood on a paintbrush, trying to, <laughs> trying to paint a psychotic message on the wall, which, uh, you know, it, it always gives me a grin.
my other favorites was this sketch we did of um, this huge big room, which is meant to represent heaven with all these angels, with all these um, hospital beds in. That was kind of interesting. You know, I had drawn up uh, the destination board that goes to elsewhere and uh, other things. I, I, I think I came up with most of those uh, destinations on there. And uh, we couldn't find one of those boards, you know, in Wilmington that was workable. So we sort of designed our own really quickly and, and sort of uh, made it work. And, and uh, I, got to, uh, I got to sort of help Les figure out how to do sort of the in-camera effects that we had. We had the, uh, the priest in the, in the bell jar, you know, where he's stuck in there. And we figured out how to, how to sort of set that up with a half-silvered mirror in front of the... Uh, in front of the lens, and uh, a, a little bell jar over uh, over to the side, and uh, and the poor actor standing in front, just sort of miming his way through the whole thing. And and we we uh, did a, a series of photographs with our uh, with our lead man John Kretschmer, just sort of doing that pose in a sparklet uh, water bottle, uh, and uh, that sort of sold the idea of how to do that in camera and quickly and and cleanly, uh, and. Uh, I guess uh, Jerry Fisher, the DP, uh, really hated that because it took so long to <laughs> set it up. But you know, it looks good in the movie. I guess it was a, a sort of uh, an abandoned cement factory uh, just outside of Wilmington that we shot that in, and it was uh, it was really you know big, and we had to fill as much of the space as we could and sort of dress it. We had big fake bottoms of columns and. Uh, and things like that, that uh, the folks at uh, DreamQuest did a, a beautiful matte painting to fill out in the, in the big reveal. A lot of it was challenging. You know, I, I tell you, one of the things that was really challenging were the um, feathers on the angels, and those big angel pieces. They, they, they took some doing and getting them on the people. You know, I mean, it was a, a, an all-round all effect, uh, you know, effort. I remember, you know, we were down to the wire getting everything ready. We had these beautiful angel wings. Our sculptor Brian Cole sculpted for us because originally uh, the director wanted them to sort of be like statuary almost. And then when he saw them, he realized, well, you know, that's kind of not what I wanted after all. So the night before, we had like, I think, 12 pairs of angel wings that we were uh, busy gluing real feathers onto before they started filming and, you know, and spray painting them white. And oh my goodness, that was, uh, <laughs> that was a lot of fun, I guess is the word. Now, in retrospect, it was fun. But uh, at the time, it was a bit of a nail biter because we didn't know if anything was gonna be dry by the time they rolled cameras. <laughs> Brad Dourif, who is absolutely incredible in the release version, um, I remember seeing his scenes in the original room at Daly's because I had drawn up that original uh, cell that he was in, which looked a, a heck of a lot like uh, a medieval torture room made out of stone walls and uh, dripping stones and a big drain in the center of the room. It was very sort of gothic and medieval. The cell was changed uh, because they, you know, wanted to do, they, they wanted to rethink that scene a little bit. And um, so the cell changed uh, after we were done. The, the first shooting crew was done. And uh, I guess they did the uh, reshoots in Los Angeles. And they rethought the design of that cell and made it more into like a hospital room. Um, and, you know, of course, this was a big surprise for me watching the film because I hadn't seen any of that before. But, uh, you know, I understood what, what had gone on and, and it, was, uh, it was fascinating. And it's interesting to see uh, Jason Miller doing the scenes that Dourif had done before. And he's just as, uh, as believable and scary in that role. Um, but in a different way because you also, you know, bring all the, uh, all the remembrances of the original Exorcist movie with seeing him. So I, I, think, uh, I think that's probably, that was a good choice to, uh, and, and lucky to bring him back. When I did see it, I, um, I, I thought it was okay, but it wasn't what I, we'd shot in the first place. The 
the end you know, sort of uh, exorcism and sort of dream dreamlike images that are in that are really effective and they're scary as hell, um, literally. And and it, it just brings up the, the wonderful uh, wonderful George C. Scott speech when he's hanging up on the on the wall, you know, I I, I believe in death, I believe in stink. It's aw awesome. It, it would have been nice to if the if the story had been sort of established earlier how we would have integrated it better in, into the movie. It was, you know, you know it uh, was a decision to make and um, maybe didn't come out as well as it might have done. You know, the thing is, we never really had the last pages of the script during shooting. They were never released to us. So we knew that something was going on in terms of them trying to figure out what the, what the final, you know, the final section of the movie was going to be about. Um, when I saw the movie, it, it because I wasn't familiar with it, and I was so familiar with everything that we had shot, it was a little jarring to me, especially the uh, Nicole Williamson scenes, uh, which were sort of lit a little differently than uh, the rest of the film. And uh, I mean, the, I think they, you know, in the the story, I think works. It seems. To me, it seemed a little bit tacked on, just a little, but I think a lot of that had to do with my familiarity with uh, the rest of the, of the film as we had shot it. I saw it just recently, just to, so that I could talk to you and still remember it because such so many things since then. But, um, you know, I, I liked the film, I, I did. I thought it was well done and it was, you know, scary and um, interesting stuff. It's a quality movie and it has great characters in it, it has great dialogue. I'm so pleased that, you know, here we are many, many years later talking about it, and it's very exciting, and it's, it's one of the films that I'm, you know, especially glad to have on my resume.